I'm glad I know this. Okay, now it's recorded. Yeah, so, you know, this is from YouTube, so you can just watch it, but this is the day of the landing. And actually, well, actually, let me roll back. This is the computer graphics of the uh, landing scene, landing scene uh, uh, from third person view. So this, this explains how, you know, this robot landed on Mars. Maybe some of you are very really familiar with it, um, but, you know, um, it comes, uh, it plunges to the atmosphere directly from the interplanetary orbit, right? And uh, it separates the cruise stage. goes into the atmosphere. Uh, this is where most of the deceleration happens. So basically, you know, it goes down to Mars like a fireball. You know, not much interesting happens uh, up to this time uh, in terms of software, uh, but then, parachute and then you're gonna deploy the uh, bottom cover and then interesting thing gonna happen so let's see so at this point we turn on the camera and then There is an onboard image process to identify where the lander is heading to, and it diverts the landing point if it is heading to a dangerous place. Then it comes down. And the sky plane hovers like 20 meters above and hangs the bomber. Uh, when it touches down, it cuts off, you know, the cable. And that's how, and you know, this was, uh, you know, easy. Uh, so uh, let, let me show you the real uh, images. So first, this is a picture right after the separation of this um, uh, bottom cover. So uh, with a wide angle camera. So. You know, there's so much information uh, story. You know, here is the, you know, cover, uh, heat shield, um, right after separation, and you can see the thin atmosphere of Mars. You know, on the upper left corner is a dark, uh, a black. This is you know, really space. And as you go down towards Mars, there's some you know white stuff. This is the atmosphere. Uh, we landed in the middle of the crater called Jezero. You know, Jezero means lake in, uh, I don't know, which I think it was a Slavic language. It was a lake uh, like 4 billion years ago. And you see the crater rim here, right? This is about the size of Lake Tahoe. So it's pretty big, right? And uh, there is a delta here created by the river that um, was flowing into this crater again four billion years ago, and this delta was the um, goal for exploration. Um, I said there's an interesting thing happening after the heat shift separation. That was what we called terrain relative navigation. So we you know, take the pictures and do the feature matching with the orbital images to figure Hey, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, no yeah, problem. Sorry, I was lost, I guess. Uh, anyways, I was about to play a cool movie. So let's get back. Okay, oh, I have to share the sound. Let's see. Yeah, so uh, I was talking about this terrain derivative navigation, you know, that, that's the onboard image processing the feature matching to identify the location of the lander during descent. Okay, now, let me finally. Kilometers of the surface. So this is the uh, real images. 
during descent to, descend on the parachute. to the surface. And the, the parachute is on uh, 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 at this moment. Subsequently, the priming but of the landing the image processing has started already. Is about 90 meters per second at an altitude of 4.2 kilometers. So what it does is to use radar, radar and uh, uh, okay, cameras. A radar. The confirmation that the lander vision system has produced a valid solution and part of terrain relative navigation. So what he said was that uh, you know, it locked on the uh, TRM, you know, the feature matching engine. converged. So um, now, you know, it could have, so it separated the parachute now. You can see that the, the field of view tilted towards Mars. right. We have because that the back it, you know, it banked, tilted the, 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 the sky crane to you know, uh, give the horizontal an velocity and change the landing point. The surface of Mars. Now, it tilts the uh, body the we other way to cure the horizontal velocity. And now Current going straight down, per second, altitude of about 300 meters we will start seeing the rocket plume. We have started our constant velocity. Here we go. Accordion, which means we are conducting and the sky top crane. top left is the, the camera look, be, looking up the sky crane, top down, sky uh, crane the, maneuver the, has sorry, started. the left, left bottom. That's the rover looking the down surface. from the sky crane. And it slowly, you know, goes down till the rover detects a touchdown. We're getting signals from MRO. And it cuts the cable. Tango Delta. Touchdown nice confirmed. Away. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking the sands of past life. That was a moment of lifetime. But unfortunately, you know, we are in COVID and I am on the surface team. And all the landing folks can, are allowed to be on lab, so I was I could not join the party. Uh, but nonetheless, Ooh. that's me still being from home <laughs> with my family. <laughs> and of course, you know the living room is as messy as possible. Uh, my daughter is five. Uh, Here's the drawing that my daughter um, produced. You know, uh, I guess she was inspired. Um, there's a picture of Earth and Mars. You know, on Mars, there's a rover and Mars Hilly that uh, I'm going to talk shortly. On Earth, there is the flags of uh, the US, Japan, where I'm from, and a penguin, which is very important for her. So I guess, you know, the rover is at least as important as penguin which is great, you know, good sign. Uh, she loves it. Okay, um, so uh, this is the photo taken right after the, the very first drive of the rover. And uh, here's my annotation. There are lots of uh, information in this, you know, um, single picture. Uh, there is a, yeah. uh, what's up? Yeah. All right. I had a couple of questions, if you don't Yeah, mind. sure. No problem. Go ahead. Looking at that video, um, how, what's the resolution of the camera? Because it looked like it made the decision from pretty high up. Uh, and I was yeah. wondering like, how well it could see, really see the ground. So I don't have the number top of my head. Um, I think you know, uh, it's still like, kilometers above the, the surface. And the divert maneuver is in the order of, you know, 100 meters. So, you know, it's not like, you know, a, a pinpoint landing to the precision of like centimeters. You know, we're talking about, you know, tens of meters. Thank you. Yep. Okay. I lost the uh, mouse cursor. Oh, there you go. Let me share again. Okay, so yeah, you know, uh, 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 notice that the color tone of the surface is a little bit different on those two places. This is the blast marks, you know, uh, the the rocket jet, you know, just blasted the surface rigorously away. Um, the landing site was named. Uh, Octavia E. Balta landing after you know the famous um, uh, female um, science fiction writer. 
um, you know, there's a wheel track. That's the uh, very first wheel track that this rover left on this planet. And on the back, there is a delta, you know, this uh, hill, it's a uh, height is about 10, tens of meters. The delta is there, that's where we are going to. And on the back, there are mountains. That's actually the crater bit. And there's a little bit of valley here, you know, where the mountain is low. This is where the river flowed in, um, like ancient time. Finally, there's a little rock here, you know, after this, Picture was released. It was a Twitter, you know, moment when everyone said, "Hey, that's a robot just killed a uh, killed a rat on Mars." Uh, you know, it looks like a rat, but this is, this is not a dead rat. This is just a rock. Um, so here is a very nice uh, panorama uh, captured from the rover. Uh, this hill it's called Kodiak. This is a, 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 a remnant of the delta. You know, uh, the, all, all the delta between these hills and the main delta was eroded away, but somehow that stacked. Um, this place, uh, you know, again, uh, this is the uh, valley where the river flew in uh, ancient time. You know, um, you can see the hill, that's delta where we are heading to. And you can see that there are lots of uh, sand dunes, right, uh, um, um, in front of the delta. This is where, you know, we avoided, we diverted away during descent. We didn't want to land in the middle of the dunes, you know, maybe a rover could be trapped in the middle of the dune. Uh, so we diverted away from these places. Um, you know, notice that the sky is blue. Uh, it's actually not blue, uh, but scientists, you know, change the color. Uh, it is a false color um, so that, you know, it's uh, easier for human eyes to, you know, investigate things. Okay, yeah, I think this is closer to the uh, true color, I suppose. A selfie uh, by uh, the rover. Uh, who took this selfie? Any guess? Do we bring a, a human uh, to to take a picture of us? No, of course. You know we have a camera at the end of the uh, a robotic arm, and this is a, a mosaic of I don't know uh, tens of images, and we just you know removed the arm uh, in the uh, post processing. Uh, by the way, you know uh, there is a Chinese rover landed around the same time. They have a, a interesting, clever way of bringing its own uh, Wi-Fi camera. Uh, uh, so they just you know uh, threw the camera on the ground and took the selfie. Uh, we took the different approach. Um, so yes, you know this time rover took his friend, her friend maybe. I don't know what the agenda. Anyways, um, but you know following the convention from. Maritime convention, we usually, you know, um, use uh, female pronouns for spacecrafts. Um, anyways, so she took her friend, uh, Mars Helicopter Ingenuity, and that was, became the first vehicle ever in the history that flew on another planet. That was April 19th uh, in the last year. It was only like a 30 second ish flight, just uh, went above like three meters and came down. Uh, but, you know, just to underscore the historical significance, you know, about a hundred and some years ago, you know, uh, uh, this, you know, brothers flew the first airplane and that was just 12 seconds, 12 second flight over just uh, 37 meters. That was the first flight on Earth, but you know, uh, yeah, there, there are many airplanes that can fly longer and you know, higher, but you know, this sticks in the history because that was the first in the world. Um, you know, this heli, you know, in the future, maybe there are gonna be a lot of airplanes or helis flying around Mars sky, but I'm pretty sure it's gonna to stick to the history book because this was the first on this world. And by the way, you know, uh, um, a little bit of a tribute to the brothers. Um, we, um, you know, put a small piece with the fabric from the first right flyer uh, on the backside of the solar panel. 
So, you know, imagine like hundreds of years from now, there's a museum on the digital crater of Mars, there will be suddenly, uh, you know, um, display of this helicopter along with this tiny piece of the, the red flyers. So two firsts together. This is the aerial photo uh, from Hilly. Can you find the rover in this picture? Yeah, it's on, on the corner here. Now it flies much longer. I think the record was is 600 meters in one flight. There was an interesting uh, uh, phenomenon happened, by the way, on flight six, the, um, the helicopter oscillated uh, anomalously, uh, anomalously, and it landed safely nonetheless. Uh, it turned out that, that you know it uses VO visual odometry and for whatever reason one image frame was skipped so the following image frame uh, had wrong timestamps right so that was the reason of oscillation but you know we have a you know uh, um, the uh, stability margin that is big enough to accommodate this um, you know anomaly so fortunately you know uh, we didn't lose the heli. So my, uh, I think the biggest contribution from myself uh, to this project was the autonomous driving algorithm uh, that I wrote together with my colleagues. So, um, you know, um, we've been driving on Mars automatically since, I don't know, 15 years ago, but we made a substantial enhancement to it. Um, now it can drive, you know, uh, a few hundred meters per cell, as opposed to tens of meters in the previous rovers, fully autonomously. And so far, 50% of the total distance driven by the rover was an autonomous drive, uh, as opposed to 6.4% in the previous rover mission. So it uses this stereo vision, this is the real images from Mars, um, to identify obstacles and the stereo processing to create the uh, t point five d map, which is used for path planning. And here is the, uh, uh, where the rover is right now. We landed here, right? You know, uh, you can see this region that I'm, you know, uh, I'm mark, um, show, pointing with my mouse. Uh, you can see those ripples, these are the sand dunes. So, you know, uh, the lander originally, you know, heading towards, I don't know, somewhere here. So it uh, diverted a few hundred meters to the east and landed right next to it. So ultimately we want to go towards this delta. So, uh, you know, our plan is to go around the sandy region uh, counterclockwise, but scientists said that, you know, they want to take a look um, at the southern portion of the landing site. So we headed south first, went around this sandy region called Theta. And, you know, we flew heavy beforehand and identified that, you know, this portion of the sandy region Theta is uh, accessible. So we um, uh, dived in and took a few samples and, uh, and came out. So the rover is uh, right outside of Theta. I think it's Theta, not Theta. Uh, anyways, um, I think it's named after some um, Native American something. Uh, anyways, so, you know, uh, our plan is to drive back to the landing site and go north and go around. We made the first successful sample acquisition uh, around last fall. Um, and we've collected, uh, uh, I think, six samples so far. Uh, this is the first sample in the drill bit. So now um, that uh, you know, Perseverance is driving happily on Mars, mostly, um, we started um, the, uh, the planning of the next missions, um, which is called sample retrieval and launch mission. So the idea is that, you know, 
um, I guess I have the slide, oh, there you go. So the idea is that perseverance is over when I collect the rock samples, right? And put them in tubes. Uh, we're gonna collect about 30 to 40 tubes and it's gonna leave um, those tubes on the ground. This robot won't come back. And then the next mission, SRL, is a collaboration between NASA and ESA. It's gonna bring another rover called the Fetch Rover that you know picks up these tubes and bring back to the rocket. The rocket is going to be provided by NASA that's gonna put samples on the orbit of Mars, then there will be another mission, uh, collaboration between ESA and NASA again, that's gonna catch the sample canister in the orbit and comes back to Earth. So our hope is that, that we're gonna bring those sample back sometime in early 2030s. Really exciting. All right. Uh, you know, uh, sunset and sunrise are blue on Mars. It's beautiful, right? You know, um, so, but you know, um, perseverance, this is from curiosity. Uh, so uh, I think, you know, a few months ago, uh, perseverance for the first time, uh, you know, tried to take a picture with its famous blue sunset on Mars. It turned out not blue. What happened, right? Um, it, so it turned out that the, the color of the sunset, I think it's the same on Earth, color of the sunset and sunrise uh, depends on the dust levels um, um, in the atmosphere. You know, it, it, you know, it, 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 it influences how the lights uh, uh, at different wavelengths are scattered. So it turned out that at this season, you know, the dust level in the atmosphere was extremely low. So, you know, we didn't see the blue sunset. Um, this is again from Curiosity. Uh, this is the picture of Earth. Um, you can see it after the sunset or before the sunrise. You know, uh, look at it, how small it is. And imagine 7 billion people are living together on this small dot, you know. There are some philosophical, you know, uh, feeling uh, out from this picture. Okay, a little bit of trivia, uh, which one do you think is the closest to the speed of this rover, Perseverance? Snail, ant, sloth, human baby. Uh, that's my baby, by the way. Uh, uh, she's already five, but this was uh, like five years ago. All right. Human baby. Yes, human baby. Uh, okay, any other guess? Yeah, human, human baby. baby too. Uh, yeah, snail, snail. Let's go, ants. All right. Okay, so the answer is here. Ants is actually sloth. Uh, their speed is just 0. 0.15 miles per second, slower than ant. Uh, I, I, I seriously doubt the existential meaning of this species. Uh, anyways, uh, what they're doing, but anyways, you know. Um, and human babies is 10 times faster than sloth. Uh, anyways, um, the rover drives at 0.1 miles per hour. Very slow, right? This is the picture uh, I took in Mars yard. Um, this is the identical twin of uh, Perseverance. It's been a long time since I've seen BSTV driving around out here. Yeah, thank you. Right, I forgot how. Uh... Right, it's so slow. Why it's so slow? Well, there are many reasons, you know. Uh, um, uh, one is gear ratio, you know. We chose extremely conservative gear ratio uh, so that it can drive on anything. Um, power is another reason, you know. You cannot use, you know, combustion uh, engine. Uh, there's no, um, um, you know, uh, oxygen in the atmosphere. So it's uh, basically an electrical vehicle driven by 
the radioisotope thermal generator, right, um, which only produces 100 watts. That is stored in the battery. So, you know, uh, the driving uh, uses uh, more than 100 watts, but it's still small. Um, and the reason is that, you know, um, the onboard processing power, uh, if it drives faster, you know, um, uh, the onboard processing can catch up. So, you know, uh, qu a question, research question as a, you know, technologist is this, how can rovers drive faster, farther and safer? You know, um, the previous rovers drove like, you know, tens of kilometers for years of mission. Right, um, but if you can drive thousands of kilometers on Mars, you can visit many places, right? Um, on the moon, there are mission concepts to drive uh, over a much longer distance. So is it ever possible to drive much faster? Uh, I think it is because there is a past example, which is Apollo lunar rowing vehicle. It is again, elect electrical vehicle. Uh, there's no oxygen on the moon. Um, and it drove at, uh, uh, at 18 kilometers per hour, uh, about uh, 12 miles per second, excuse me, miles per hour. Still slow compared to the vehicles on earth, but it is a hundred times faster than, you know, our Mars rover. So how did we do this? We achieved this with a very simple mobility system and highly intelligent perception and planning algorithm implemented in the natural neural network in human brain. So that's the difference. Of course, you know, as I said, there are many other factors. So, you know, if we put human astronaut on Mars rover, can we drive hundred times faster? No, of course, but still, you know, this is a, a, a one of the uh, major factor. Uh, so my, you know, uh, um, uh, um, main research question when I'm working at, you know, the future robots is that uh, how can we help enhancing the productivity and safety of the rover by using the, the you know, state of the art uh, machine intelligence. So one of the main restriction on those rover was the computational resource because um, Perseverance uses RAD750 processor, which is basically the space version, radiation tolerant version of PowerPC 750. You know, um, if you are, you know, around the same age or older than me, um, I think you remember those, you know, um, early um, iMac, you know, after Steve Jobs came back to Apple, you know, the one with, uh, you know, kind of round shape, you know, uh, with, uh, with, with different colors from 1996 or so, um, that used PowerPC 750. So basically, you know, the uh, modern mass warbar is driven by a CPU that is 20 plus years old. So computation power is limited, single core, clocked around the 200 megahertz or something. Why? Because, you know, uh, 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 for one thing, you know, um, um, the uh, radiation tolerant CPUs are not updated as frequently as, you know, um, the ground-based CPU or processors for consumer electronics. Um, you know, another reason is that, uh, you know, we don't want to take, uh, uh, you know, extra risk. We you know, often feels more comfortable, feel more comfortable to use something that is proven before. Um, anyways, but you know, uh, we know that more computation power is needed for future applications. So on the Mars Hilly, we put Qualcomm's Snapdragon. That's basically the chip that your cell phone has, if you have Android phones. And you know, that is much more capable than this RAD 750. It has GPU, you know, AI engine. Um, so, and uh, it's much less power. So, you know, that, that uh, sort of high performance, you know, onboard computing 
is going to be a game changer. So now, you know, I am, a, you know, an autonomy researcher. So, um, um, you know, my part is, okay, what applications we can run on these chips to enhance the performance of future rovers. So here is one, you know, application that I am working on. So, as I said, you know, the rover only uses stereo vision to identify the, you know, obstacles while driving autonomously. So this is how the rover sees the world, right? Um, but of course, you know, human uses more information. Human uses semantic information from the uh, the picture. Uh, more concretely, you know, um, we know that sand caused a lot of troubles for past rovers. You know, we lost one rover because it was embedded in sand. Another rover opportunity spent, I don't know, uh, many days, many souls to get out of the sand trap, right? So rover drivers were extremely careful when driving on sandy region uh, like this. So we, developed, you know, it's sort of a, a very straightforward application of CNN, uh, but nonetheless, we trained. Um, in this case, we used Deep Lab v V3, um, and we, you know, trained with, uh, you know, labeled uh, Mars surface data. Um, then created this terrain, terrain classifier, Spark. You know, one thing that uh, we and I learned from our, um, PhD advisor at MIT is to name our algorithms after Star Trek to gain popularity. And that actually works, <laughs> particularly at NASA. Uh, so we named our program after uh, Spock. Uh, anyways, um, so uh, yeah, you know, it's a simple four way classification uh, for Martian application. Sand, soil, bedrock, and big rock, which works pretty good. Uh, uh, the, the image is below. Uh, this is our Earth demo. Um, we, in this case, we segmented the um, terrain into six classes: sand, gravel, vegetation, debris, and artifact, and horse poop. Um, so, <laughs> um, you know, um, the neighborhood of JPL is, uh, you know, kind of rich um, residential area, La Cañada, uh, where you know, um, uh, I don't know, many residents own horses. And, you know, this area called Rio Seco is a place where we often use for robot driving, but also those, you know, rich residents, you know, uh, uh, ride on their horse. So there are lots of horse poops. Uh, so we decided to train the, you know, uh, robot to avoid them uh, for an obvious reason. Anyways, uh, so, you know, um, one of the big headache for um, the deep learning is that it eats tons of data, uh, right, uh, to make it work. Um, and we initially worked with our scientists. Uh, you know, they were very collaborative. Um, and, you know, they produced, uh, produced thousands of labeled images for us. But, you know, deep learning uh, uh, needs more than a few thousand labeled images. So what we did is to turn to internet. We you know, started uh, this Zooniverse project called AI for Mars to collect, you know, uh, the terrain labels from, you know, citizen scientists. It worked very well. We collected, actually, this slide is old. I think we collected more than 500K labels so far. So I appreciate those uh, passionate uh, volunteers uh, for helping us. And all right, yeah, so, you know, training with this citizen science data set worked very well. So uh, we are now looking to um, the onboard deployment um, to be the first deep net on Mars. We'll see. Um, here's another application of machine learning, but for planting, not for perception. So, um, Current, um, let's see, the um, ENAV is the name of the algorithm we use for, uh, you know, the autonomous driving on Mars. What it does, it's a pretty straightforward 
in uh, algorithm wise, you know, it creates a height map using stereo and it runs safety, you know, it's, it's, it's a tree planning. It runs safety checks on you know, many, many paths until safe one is found, right? So uh, this might not be very efficient, fast, but uh, the safety is guaranteed simply because we run the safety check all the time, right? So, you know, um, of course, there are many ways that the machine learning can assist, you know, simply because human doesn't do path running in this way, right? You know, uh, humans are shown this kind of images, uh, produces a path like this. Uh, do human robot planners, you know, uh, lay out a tree consisting of a thousand, many thousands of path options and, you know, assess the feasibility and choose one? Of course not, right? You know, they work more intuitively. Uh, somehow this, you know, mapping from image to path is, you know, embedded in human's neural net. But so can we just, you know, replicate that? But, you know, um, um, I don't think um, for this problem, end-to-end -end black box approach is a viable, um, viable one. Uh, simply because, you know, uh, we lose the guarantee of safety, right? Rather, what we proposed is uh, a kind of, you know, combination of model-based and uh, learning approach where, yes, you know, we produce the height map, and we use the path that, that the tree search, but we use machine learning to take this height map um, and rank the path options so that the search can jump to the most promising path so that it doesn't have to, you know, investigate many, many path options to save time. And that worked pretty well, you know. So basically, it can take the best of both worlds, right? It it, it can you know exploit the uh, machine learning's power of uh, you know uh, 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 directly mapping uh, high level information to another, and also you know we can keep the guarantee of safety because we're gonna run the safe safety check at the selected path. But the number of safety checks that we have to run gonna be substantially reduced. So that's the idea. And so we run the experiment. Um, uh, simulation, of course, we haven't deployed this on real Mars rover, but we, you know, we, since we do have the real terrain data for Mars, you know, we use the data. So now uh, let me play the, the movie back again, you know, um, uh, in this example from Sol 1.22, the rover moves forward and when it detects the rock and avoid it, whoa, sorry. Um, the rover, uh, the slide slipped away. Let's try again. Yeah, here, you know, um, let me play again. There are many passes, you know, all the black passes shown on this movie are the ones that are, you know, um, um, evaluated by running this, you know, uh, safety check. This was a baseline, but with ML nav uh, heuristics, it only checked two paths until finding the feasible, um, you know, way forward. Of course, you know, there are many cases where, you know, this heuristics doesn't create, but overall, I think I have a, a statistics here. Yes. So, um, in baseline, you know, you have to run uh, the safety checks uh, on average between 200 to three, 400 times with ML nav on the benign terrain, it's just a 60 on complex terrain, it's just a, a, a you know, still a, a 142. So five to I think three times reduction. And we didn't lose the success rate, uh, actually we improved the, the drive success rate and improved the path inefficiency. So all looks good. Um, okay, so these are the applications for Mars rovers. Now, you know, uh, um, JPL is looking into, you know, uh, 
the wars beyond Mars, the main targets are the icy moons of gas giants. You know, around you know around Earth, like you know our own moon, Earth, Mars, everything is made of rocks. But if you go go beyond, you know, uh, beyond Mars, many bodies, like you know, many satellites of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are made of ice. Because ice is a very common, you know, uh, substance in, in the universe. So you know, um, many moons uh, like Europa, uh, this the core is rock, but the surface is completely covered by ice. Ganymede, uh, that's the biggest moon of uh, the solar system, that is mostly made of ice. Uh, Titan, uh, the biggest moon of Saturn, is too have a thick shell of ice, and this is a tiny moon and Enceladus uh, uh, around Saturn. So what's interesting of all of the, these moons is that it has, it's they they are likely having oceans, liquid water ocean below this ice shell, right? And actually, the volume of the water uh, in the, the ocean, subsurface ocean Europa is estimated to be like, I think three or five times greater than the earth. So, you know, the biggest ocean of the solar system is not the one on earth, it's the one on Europa or maybe other moons. So scientists suspect that life might be hosted uh, in one of these moons, right? Um, so, of course, we're gonna explore these wars. And so the first attempt um, is this um, orbiter called Europa Clipper, which will be launched in 2024. Um, this is gonna investigate Europa uh, in depth. Uh, it will not prediction but it's going to investigate the habitability of this um, tiny moon. Then we have a concept, it's not a mission yet, uh, but we have a concept of Europa lander, uh, which is going to send this, uh, uh, you know, lander to the surface. And, you know, this um, Jupiter has very strong radiation belt and Europa is orbiting right in the middle of the radiation belt. So, uh, you know, uh, we don't think there's any anything living on the surface. But if you, you know, uh, 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 dig like 10 centimeters on ice, you know, ice is an excellent insulator against radiation. So, you know, uh, at that depth, we might be able to find some signature of life. So that's this concept. Um, this is not from JPL, it's from APL, but uh, we have a, a, a planned mission to send a drone to Titan, the moon of Saturn, uh, that has a very thick atmosphere. So this mission called Dragonfly, gonna, you know, fly the sky of Titan. And again, you know, look for the habitability and I suppose the potential sign of life. So uh, another thing that is very exciting is this tiny moon, Enceladus. Uh, the size of this moon is about the state of Texas. It's basically a ball of ice, which has ocean, you know, uh, below the ice. And uh, what's exciting about this, this moon is that, that there's a crack on ice through which the ocean water is, you know, splashing out, right? So it's a, nat a natural pathway to get to the ocean. So why not building a robot to do that, right? So that's the concept that we are working on. It's called eels. It's a, it's a creepy snake-like robot that uh, drives on the surface. Yeah, let's keep around for a sake of time. Go into the vent and do some live detection. Okay, uh, so I'm just waiting some time, so let's keep ahead. Okay, so um, we are now working on a project to prototype the hardware and software of this snake robot. 
I am leading the autonomy development. There are many challenges, right? Uh, uh, first challenge is the high DOF of this robot, 48 DOF as opposed to 10 with the mass over, but there's a substantial control challenge. Challenge number two, uh, it has to have multimodal mobility. It's not just, you know, uh, roving on the surface. It has to walk on the surface, dive to the subsurface and do the vertical descent, potentially, you know, swim in the submerged environment. Uh, maybe, you know, it, uh, it also has to, you know, walk on the surface at the bottom. Challenge three, the, the visibility gonna be substantially limited uh, in the vent. Uh, I think we can see only a few meters ahead. A view could be obstructed by this plume as well. Fourth, and most importantly, there are gonna be substantial uncertainty, right? Rover has a, you know, a, a very high resolution orbital reconnaissance. We don't have that luxury, uh, you know, for underground, uh, mission. The environment is dynamic, uh, as opposed to a very static environment on Mars. So how to deal with this substantial uncertainty, that's the biggest question for this autonomy. So yeah, we are developing, you know, many capabilities. We haven't named them yet. We have to name them after Star Trek, following, uh, you know, our advisor's uh, uh, biggest lesson for us. Anyways, um, so, uh, you know, we are only three months into this project, but we've made, you know, quite a good progress. So let me show you some movie. Um, so I'm going to start off with this demo by showing what the plan is. Basically, we start so the mission. So this is a simulation-based demonstration of our controller and planner and high-level mission planner plus uh, some, you know, a, 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 um, to start the mission. Start the that goes to uh, the C6 layer, C6 layer commands. So uh, the high-level planner uh, commands, plan to the you know, planner, local the planner activity. Uh, we only have and two activities the, right now. Uh, Local Google path planner, then local path um, planner, method the, plan, uh, sorry, the controller and manager the gate control provides, and currently it's in leader follower yeah. mode, which path. was uh, commanded here. And this is where the robot would move its head back and forth to do a scan. So um, just for the sake of time, I recorded a quick thing on that. Um, where I did the scan behavior in Gazebo. Um, and so what that'll do is that'll just move the head back and forth. The entire um, software so stack is based on Ross, by the way. And um, I made this um, a prototype of the head um, on a skateboard. Um, so I, I took this thing um, and I, I pulled it around my backyard, um, you know, just back and forth in a straight line. I don't know if you guys can see that here. <laughs> Uh, so here's how the camera data looks from my backyard. Um, I, I integrated this uh, this library uh, from Scarmutz's lab called DILib, um, and it does uh, uh, feature tracking with uh, Shitomasi features or Harris corners, um, and it uses the GPU. So it's able to run like ridiculously fast. It runs like 250 hertz. Uh, and then here's how the LiDAR data looks. So this next test is similar. Um, I wanted to confirm that we would be able to run LiDAR odometry in real time on a Xavier NX. Uh, I wanted to share a scheme um, that I'm going to use to reduce uh, specular reflections. And uh, the specular reflections will maintain the, the polarized light, um, the, the, the direction of the polarized light that the illuminator had, and the diffuse reflections will be unpolarized. So you can effectively filter out all the specular ref reflections. Um, so this is this is the result of applying those filters. So on, on the left is um, no filters. Um, that was the original video I showed you. And on the right, you can see that those those white blobs, those highlights are gone. Um, and it tracks okay, pretty well along here. this yeah, line, that's, which is just uh... That's what we are working on right now. Um, that's the end of oh, just one last important slide. Okay, so yeah, you know, we are working on many things that involves autonomy, uh, 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 not necessarily like ML, but you know, um, there are lots of interesting applications. So, you know, uh, we are open for collaboration. And so, 
yeah, you know, please reach me out if you have an interesting idea that we'll bring up. Thank you, thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Hiro. Um, do you guys have any questions? I know we're right at time. Yeah, sorry for the talk running too long. I'm curious about uh, some of these navigation algorithms uh -huh. you're developing. Uh, you, you mentioned, so is the plan to maybe put some of this on the uh, on this existing rover or will, will it be for future missions? So uh, uh, which navigation you're, you're talking about? The, um... uh, the e, I think it's uh, the ML nav. Oh, okay, yeah. So, that, so um, let's see. You know, the idea of uh, this combining the ML-based heuristics and, uh, you know, model-based safety check is, I think, universal, right? Uh, you know, it can be applied to, I think, not just a rover, maybe, you know, uh, it can be applicable to manipulation or, you know, whatever. Uh, our implementation uh, that we produce from the project is specific to, you know, the rover. Basically, that's... Uh to use the spare Snapdragon uh, chip, right? Okay. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's not really a spare, you know, it's uh, it's being used for, uh, uh, um, the, as, as a base station by Heli. So, you know, <laughs> of course, uh, I wish that the Heli gonna, you know, live long, but, uh, you know, once Heli dies, the Snapdragon is ours, <laughs> for hours to use. Um, well, of course, you know, I, 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 I am not wishing for this, you know, uh, hopefully it's going to last many, many years to come. In future missions, is there more of a, uh, of a plan to use COTS hardware instead of like, you know, the, like the Snapdragon that you, mm. you guys sent this time? Or is it still going to be very custom? So that's a great question. Um, I cannot say about the future trend, but you know, um, 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 we tend to use accept the cut devices more for smaller missions. You know, there's a classification like class A, class B, class C, class D, and class A means you know a flagship mission where we have to minimize the risk to I don't know ninety nine point nine or I forgot. Class D, I, I think the heli was class D, uh, which, you know, uh, has a more accepting risk posture. So for those things, we can use, we can use something new, like COTS processor. And maybe, you know, if it's, it's proven in class D or C or B, then we can perhaps use it for class A. I saw there's a fiducial marker on the rover. Is that for the helicopter? <laughs> oh, the no, helicopter. no, no, no. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, I, I, I actually don't know what those fiducial markers are for. You know, obviously, something to you know, uh, 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 capture the robot's pose and other things. Uh, but you know, actually, one of the risks that we consider um, we are concerned with is that heli loses control and crash into, you know, the, uh, the rover in a kamikaze style. We don't want to do that, right? So, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, initially, you know, uh, uh, rover was around to document the flight, but rover, you know, just nonetheless drove like a few hundred meters back just in case. So, and there's a no fly zones around rover. Sure. And for the EOS robot, um, is the plan to mount cameras and lidars? Um, yeah, so you know, for the Enceladus mission, of course, we don't know yet. You know, this is not the mission yet. Uh, but what we are doing right now is Earth demo. Um, so uh, we are designing the sensor head right now. Uh, but our, our idea is to have the uh, have a, a, a rider and also um, a wide angle stereo cameras on all sides. Uh, so we're gonna use both uh, vision and LiDAR. Why did you choose the eel format, the eel shape for yeah, this? Yeah, uh, great question, great question. Yeah, so there are many factors. Um, um, so 
one reason is that you know the, uh, you know we don't know much about this erupting vent and uh, it could be as narrow as 10 centimeters so like you know it's like this right so you know and we need to carry you know our science instrument actuation etc etc so you know the natural uh, uh, shape that allows us to go through this 10 centimeter throat while you know uh, uh, um, um, accommodating you know many things is this you know uh, long snake like shape and how do you communicate back the information you gather does the eel crawls back up ah, that's another the... great question we think we're going to use a tether to communicate to a, a surface lander and then the surface you know lander going to talk to earth yeah, thank you Um, any more questions? As far as the simulation tools are concerned, do you use something like uh, specific tools that you have developed in house, or are there tools like uh, typical physics simulations mm. that the robots community would be using? Yeah, great question. We have the in house physics based simulation called DARTS. Uh, I think we provide licenses to uh, external partners, which is pretty good, actually. Uh, we use DARTS for many purposes, like, you know, we use it for the simulation of the atmospheric entry to Mars, for example. Um, so it's been used in many missions. Uh, we, you know, but it's, it's a complex system, um, not as handy as ROS. So, I mean, we have ROS integration, but so at the current stage, you know, since our DARTS sim is not put together yet, we use, you know, gazebo and RVs um, as an interim uh, simulation and visualization. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much for the talk, Hiro. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much. This was great. Yep. Okay, bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.